So quick revision. We've been looking at derivatives the last few weeks, which is a branch of calculus. And when we derive a um, function, you get its derivative. And we interpret it, or we, we represent it by f dash x, which by definition is the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, which you can think of it as the limit of delta y over delta x as delta x approaches zero, which we write as dy dx. And remember, that means f dash x, which is the derivative with respect to x, or dy dx, simply represents a rate of change. More specifically, it represents an instantaneous rate of change of y. But it's an instantaneous change of y as x changes. And that is fundamentally what the derivative, re derivative represents. Now, the first few weeks, we talked about how to do the derivative. And so we've basically then went through and, where did my screen go? There it is. So last few weeks we went through and used first derivatives and we showed how when you derive a function plus or minus function, then it's basically the derivative of the first function plus or minus the derivative of the second function. We also showed you that the derivative of a constant times a function is equal to a constant times the derivative of that function. We also then went through and worked out that the derivative of x half n equals n x to n minus one. And as a result, the derivative of a constant is always zero. And the derivative of x plus b is always a. We also talked about what the derivative of this would be. That'll be a n x plus b to the n minus one. And of course, we went through the fact that you need to use the chain rule, product rule, and quotient rule. So we've got the chain rule, which means that dy dx is equal to dy du times du dx. You've got the product rule, which tells you if y equals uv, then y dash equals u dash v plus uv dash. And you've got the quotient rule which tells you if y equals u over v, then y dash must equal u dash v minus u v dash in v squared. So those are the main things we've covered in previous weeks. And then last week, we basically started talking about how to use these. And so remember, remembering that dy dx represents a rate of change of y as x changes, and more specifically, the instantaneous rate of change of y as x changes, then we can interpret it graphically. It is the gradient. Because delta y changing y over delta x, which is changing x, is a gradient. And since we're talking about the instantaneous rate of change of y as x changes, then it's the gradient of the curve at a particular point, which is more accurately if you wanted to make the distinction, described as the gradient of the tangent to the curve at that point. As a result, we can talk about finding the tangent. So if you have y equals fx, and you've got a point p at a f of a, then your first step is to find y dash and then you would sub in x equals a so the gradient would be equal to f dash a and then once you've got the gradient of the tangent 
you would then find out the, the equation using either y equals mx plus b or y minus y1 equals mx minus x1, where m, which is the gradient, represents f dash a. And you can just sub in your you know, two points, two coordinates, a, f of a, over here, into this equation or this equation. Either way works. Your second version is to find the normal equation. If you found the normal equation, then what will be different will be this step. We know the gradient of the tangent is f dash a, so the gradient of the normal would be negative one over f dash a, and then step three would be repeat with the gradient of the norm. So no problems with any of that? No. No. Everything clear? Sorry, I just have to go to the bathroom. Sorry, I, I'll be back in like 15. All right, sure, all right. Hope you feel okay. So let's quickly do one example question. Hopefully you guys won't have too much trouble. I don't sound doesn't sound like you guys have trouble with it. But we'll do a quick one quick example question and then we'll talk about how to use derivatives even further. So let's take um, nothing too hard. Let's say we've got something like, you know, x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4. And let's just pick a random point, like for example, 1. So you've got a point 1. So if you put in 1, then it will basically end up being 3. So you may or may not know what this curve looks like, but it's going to have this sort of idea. It's going to be at 1, 3. In fact, if we were to draw this out, we don't really know how to draw out cubics. But we could perhaps try to think of it as x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4. And in other words, we don't really know how to draw cubics that nicely. But if we try to draw this out, we could factor out the x squared, which would give us x minus 2 plus 4. And this is something that you should be able to draw nicely. Do you guys know how to draw x squared times x minus 2 nicely? Ignoring the plus four. Janelle, do you know how to draw that? Um, not when it's times the x minus two. But okay. I know it's a parabola, the x squared. The x squared is a parabola, but when you multiply by x minus two, what's the power going to be in total? Three. It's going to be power three, so it won't be a parabola anymore. Paris, do you know how to draw this? Like, ignore the plus four. Do you know how to draw this? It's it's like a parabola, but then one side goes down and the other side goes up. Well, that's <laughs> definitely not a parabola, right? A parabola has both sides going the same way, so you can't tell me it's zero. You know, so, so I think I know what you mean when you say that, except you can't you can't describe it that way. Um, describing it that way is like. Well, it's like a circle, but it's not closed. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, it's, it, I mean, I can kind of let you get by with saying like an ellipse is kind of like a circle, but you can't tell me like a parabola is like a circle, you know? Like a cubic, is it cubic graph? Yeah, it's definitely going to be a cubic because it's a power three. But the question is, do you know what the cubic looks like? Yeah. Okay. On the right, which way is it going to go, up or down? Oh, um, on the right. Yeah. To go up. On the left. Down. Does it gonna? Is it? Can you tell me anything else about it? And then, wait. Do we ignore the four or not? Ignore the four for the moment. Sorry, what? Ignore the four right now. Oh. Just do the. Uh, just do the green bit. Is it gonna move to the? Left, right, left, by two. Okay, so we can obviously do this question with calculus, but let's try to sort of focus on this question. So I want to kind of get you guys to just, you know, 
try to increase your kind of how comfortable you are these things with our calculus. Now, I gave you a cubic. You guys can probably draw parabolas quite well. Cubic's not so much. And yeah, if I just give you this cubic and I didn't rig it, then you probably don't know how to draw it very well. And I kind of didn't deliberately rig it, so it's not that nice. But now we can do this. We can kind of deal with it. So let's just draw this. Ignore the four. Now, when you draw cubics, let's start with even easier ones, right? If I have something like this, do you guys know how to draw that? Yeah. Yeah? How do you draw that? Well, you know that x intercepts. Right. The x intercepts are? 1, 2, and negative 5. Correct. So basically, you solve for them equal to 0, and your x intercepts will be equal to x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals negative 5, and then? Or, and then you know if it's negative or positive. Yeah, you know it's positive because it's a positive x times a positive x times a positive x. So that means it's going to go up on the right and down on the left. And because you know all the intercepts, you basically just draw it in. Okay. So it's going to be like a 2, 1, negative 5. And you can work this out. And that's going to be 10. Something like that. All right, so that you guys know how to do. Do you guys know how to do something like this? Yeah. Yeah, how do you do that? It's the same thing. It's just the one, it bounces off the x. Exactly. So this is power two. So at x equals one, it's going to turn back. It's a turning point. And this is y x equals negative three. And so indeed, because you're still positive, I'm just going to go down. That one, I'm going to turn, and then I'm going to get minus three. So it'll generally look like this. And do you guys know how to do, for example, this? Power three. Well, if it's power three, all you're really doing is it's just your cubic. And it will kind of do this. So that's the idea. If it's power one, you just go through. If it's power two, you kind of bounce back. If it's power three, you go through horizontally. And so here, this question, that's power two and zero. So this is at x equals zero. And this is at x equals two. And so basically at x equals two, you go through. At x equals zero, you bounce back. And so if we ignore the four for the moment, it's just going to do this. Something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so that means if we're adding four, we're basically just going to make all the, you know, y coordinates larger by four. So that's going to be four. And we know already that this is one, three, because we already worked it out. You're putting one, you get three. So that really just means it's going to look something along the lines of this. It's going to look like that. Approximately. So I guess I haven't really given a great example because um, when I do this, it's not very clear where the turning point is. So if I had picked, for example, three, then it'd be very clear that the tangent's going to go positive, right? But I guess we have some idea of what it looks like, but this doesn't really help us work it out. We could either have a positive gradient as our tangent, we could have a negative gradient as our tangent, or it could be flat. We, we don't know, right? But we do have a reasonable idea of what it looks like. But unfortunately, it doesn't help us work out when we get our answer if it's any good. So we'll just have to do the calculus now. And we won't really know. But that's okay. So when we do the calculus, you derive. Get that. In our case, we're subbing in 1. 
So it's going to be 3 minus 4, which is negative 1. And so that means your gradient is minus 1. And then you'll basically do y minus y1 equals m x minus 1. And so we will get y equals negative x plus 2. So we're saying actually that your negative 1, your, your 1 is more like somewhere on the left, not down there. It's more like here. Something like that. And so that's your tangent equation. If we were doing the normal, whether well, the gradient would equal 1, and you've got y minus y1 equals x minus 1, so y must equal x plus 2. That's interesting. That's got to be a plus 4. Yeah. They couldn't possibly be the same one. So yeah, I made a mistake over here. And that's your normal. All right, all clear with that? Yeah. All right, great. So now let's move on and think about this. I know this is repetitive, but I do it because it's important. What does dy dux represent again? Janelle? Uh, the rate of change. Of what? Of x as y, I mean, of y as approaches zero. Wait, is there as a... As delta x approaches zero. Yeah. All right. Now that's dy dx. Now, what if I changed it to like dz dx? How else would that be? Did you just say my name? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, instantaneous rate of change of z as yeah. x changes. Right. What about d, you know, r, d, t? Janelle? Uh, the instantaneous rate of change of r as delta t changes? Yeah, as t goes to zero. So basically, in more general terms, although we've been dealing with y and x, the derivative of something with respect to something is really the instantaneous rate of change of the object at the top as the bottom changes. And the earlier you kind of understand that part, the, the easier. And this top and bottom could be anything. Now, of course, we could change it so it's not graphical, but we'll stick with graphical for the moment. When the top is y and the bottom is x, and then it's just a gradient, right? But that is what a derivative is. Now, I also want you to think about this. So keep that in mind, the positive derivative is a rate of change of the top, whatever you're deriving, right? As your bottom changes, right? Depending on what your variable is. Now, um, in our situation here at the moment, x. Now, the next thing I want you to think about is when we derive something, what sort of thing are we deriving? I'm looking for a very general answer here, but you know, you just need to think, when you're deriving something, what, what is the sort of thing you're deriving? The gradient? You're not deriving a gradient. It might represent a gradient, but that's not what you're deriving. You derive something else, right? So, you know, think about it this way, like, you know, you, you might have taken, like, as an example, right, you might have taken a sign of something and you got a half, right? So the half was your result. A half is a number, right? But what did we take the sign of? Like, when you take sign, you take a sign of what? Okay. What, Paris, what did you say? 30? Oh, yeah, it's 30. I don't really care about the 30 itself, but more generally, 
whenever you take a sign of anything, you're taking a sign of what? Angle. Yeah, exactly. You're taking a sign of an angle and you end up with a? Ratio. Yeah, which is a? Number. Number. Correct. So I'm looking, I'm trying to get you guys to sort of think about that. So you guys understand with trig that you're, when you're taking a sine or cosine or tangent, you're taking a sine, cosine or tangent of an angle. I don't really care about the 30 degrees and a half right now, um, you, but you recognize that you're taking a sine, cosine or tangent of an angle and the end result is a number, which means sine of 30 degrees, if you like, represents a number. It's just another way to write a half. And I want you to kind of think about the same thing for a derivative. When you're deriving something, what is that something you're deriving? What goes in the bracket when you derive? Uh, function. Exactly. You're deriving a function. Now, right now, you only know how to derive one type of function, but in general, you know, we'll talk about how to derive functions and we'll, you know, in later weeks, talk about how to derive other functions. Right now, you ha it has to be a power of x, right? But in general, though, you're not entirely limited to a power of x. You're just deriving functions. And what's your result? Once you derive a function, what's your result? So you take a function, you derive it, and you get something. What sort of thing do you get? So, you know, if we take n, x to the power of n, for example, that's a specific function, right? Or, you know, we can say x squared. x squared is a specific function. So this is like taking, you know, sine of 30 degrees. And we get 2x. So x squared is a function, right? What's 2x? The rate of change. It is, but I guess, you know, it's a bit like saying a half is a half, right? I'm trying to figure out what it's representing. So x, you know, you derive a function and you would get a. probably not worried about the meaning, I'm worried about what it is. So not what it means, which is potentially a gradient, but when you derive a function, you're going to end up with a derivative of the function, which is ultimately a? Gradient. That's what it represents, but what is the thing itself? What is the derivative itself? So what sort of thing is 2x? Don't overthink it. X squared was a function, right? What's 2x? Uh, also a number. It's not a number. It's not a number. But you and said also a? It's also a? Starting with f. Uh, a function too? Yeah, it's a function. Now it's not the same function, but it's also a function. Right? So the point I'm making here is when you derive things, you're deriving functions. And the answer to the derivative is also a function. So it's a bit like, you know, if I add numbers together, I'm going to get another number. All right? But let's be clear here. You know, when we're deriving things, we're deriving the function. We're not deriving x, for example, or, you know, we're deriving a function. And your result will be, you know, another function, which will be the derivative, obviously. So we'll just give it the name derivative, but it is ultimately still a function. Does that make sense? So we're going to kind of rely on the fact that you have a function. Okay. And if we derive it, we're going to get another function, yes? But what do we call this function? If you derive a function, you get something, we call it the?
derivative. Not too hard. We normally represent a function with fx. And how do we represent the derivative function? f dash x. Yeah, f dash x. So you take a function, you derive it, you get the derivative, which you write as f dash x. And everyone's happy with that, right? Yeah. But let's reiterate what we said before. If you have to start with a function fx and you derive it, you're going to get some other, you're going to get the derivative, but what is this derivative itself? The function? Another it's a function. So can we derive it again? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a function, so why not? So there's no real reason in general why we can't just derive it again. So if we derive it again, then you just get, I suppose, the derivative of this thing, right? So you're taking the derivative of the derivative, right? Mm -hmm. In which case you've taken the derivative twice. So we just call that the second derivative. And since we're talking about taking derivatives multiple times, we'll now call this the first derivative. Now, if the, if you start with a function and you derive it and you get something called the first derivative, which is after all a function, which you can derive again, well, what sort of thing is this? Function. Still a function. So can we derive that? Yes. Yeah. So I guess there's no real reason why we can't just keep deriving. And you'll get the third derivative, so on. And so, you know, we could keep going probably not really necessary. For the most part, you'll be focusing on these three. But you get the concept. You've got a function. If you derive it, you get another function. So you could just derive that thing again, and that you can derive that thing again, you can derive that thing again, and keep going. And so the second derivative is normally written as f double dash x like this. And the third derivative is often written as f triple dash like that. And sometimes if you go further, you just write f four dash and so on, like, like a four or something. All right, so you understand that ultimately all of these are functions. And if we stick with this being a function and this being the first derivative, then we said the first derivative represents what? What does it represent? Well, what does a derivative represent? The gradient. Graphically, yes. Let's be more general about it. What does the what does the derivative always represent? Rate of change. Correct. So it represents the rate of change of f dash x uh, of f x as x changes. So, firstly, is everyone happy with that statement? Yep. All right. And we also said, and you guys have said many, many times, and that's good that this represents the gradient of the tangent. And we will talk a little bit more about that and how to use that a bit more. But before we do that, I want you to think about this. What does the second derivative represent? The rate of change of the first derivative. derivative. Exactly, exactly. Because the second derivative is the derivative of the first derivative just like the first derivative is the derivative of the function. And since it's the first, it's the derivative of the function, then it's the rate of change of the function. But the second derivative is the derivative of this. So it's the rate of change of that. So it's the rate of change of the first derivative. But remembering that the first derivative represents the gradient of the tangent, you can think of this as the rate of change of the gradient of the tangent. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we are now really saying that the second derivative is really representing how quickly the gradient of the tangent changes. And now I kind of want you to think about that. What would that mean? See, the first derivative was the rate of change of y as x changed. And if you thought about it a bit, you would go, yeah, that's the gradient. 
but the second unit is the rate of change of the gradient. So think about it, maybe, maybe draw a little bit or something, but you know, if the gradient doesn't change or, you know, if you've got something like this, see, think about the gradient, right? You've got tangent, tangent, tangent. In this case, what's happening to the gradient as we go to the right? More steep. Right. So as X goes to the right, the gradient is going up, right? And we can, you know, take this example. What's happening as X goes to the right? Goes up as well. Yep, this one goes up as well. All right, so let's, you know, draw a few more. What's happening to the gradient as x goes to the right? Negative. Yep. Yeah. What about if we had something like this? As X goes to the right. Goes down. And this one. Go up. The gradient's going up. Goes down also. It's going down also, right? So let me maybe, you know, rub this one out. That one's probably the easiest one, but let me just rub that one out. What about if I did this? happening to the value of the gradient. Goes down. Paris says goes down. Chanel, what do you think? Uh, go down. You think it goes down? Um, Tiffany, are you back? All right. So we'll focus on the ones that confuse you guys the most. So remember, my question is what happens to the gradient? And you guys are confused about these two. So let's look at those two in a bit more detail. So we will just, you know, take, we don't need to have exact numbers, but let's have some idea. So we can draw one gradient there. We can draw one gradient here. And we can kind of draw one gradient here, kind of thing. All right. So we've got point A, B, and let's say C. All right. So let's consider this. At A, what do you think the gradient is? Janelle, can you give me a number? Like just, uh, you don't know exactly what it is, but just give me some rough idea what you think it might be. Maybe three. Positive or negative? Negative. All right, so let's go with negative three. All right, let's go with that. So at A, if it's negative three, now what do you think the gradient at B would be then, um, Paris? Uh, negative two. 
Yeah, we could go with negative two. Doesn't matter. Okay. And what do you think the gradient at C would be, um, Chanel? Uh, maybe only negative one. All right. Let's just, you know, who cares? Let's say negative one. So think about this. Um, as you go from A to C, as we go from A to C, the X value is getting bigger, right? As we go from A to C, right? You know, you go from minus one to one to five or whatever the numbers are. Yes. And what's happening to the uh, gradient? What's happening to M? It goes from negative three to negative two to negative one. So? It goes up. It goes up. Does that make sense? You see, the question is not, is M positive or negative? That's not my question, right? The gradient is negative, but that's not my question. My question is, as x changes, what happens to the gradient and it's going up? Do you see that? Yeah. Janelle, is that clear? Yeah. And similarly, We also have the other situation. So remember, you need to pay attention to the question. The question is not what is the value of the gradient, but what happens, you know, as the gradient, you know, what is happening to the gradient. And so let's take a few sample points, like let's say A there, let's say B here, let's say C there. All right. So we're going to have A, we're going to have B, we're going to have C. All right, so at A, what is the gradient? Uh, pass, give me an example. At five. All right, at B, Janelle? Three. All right, at C, Paris? One. All right, so... As we go from A to C, as is before, because we're going from left to right, X is getting bigger. And we're always, when we take the derivative, we're always assuming that we're increasing X, right? We're always increasing the variable that we're deriving with respect to. And look at what happens to M. You're going from five to three to one. What's happening to M? It decreases? Yeah, it's getting smaller. So with that clarification in mind, that means this is actually M getting smaller. Oh, sorry, that is M getting bigger. And this is, as X goes up, M is getting smaller. And so you might see, therefore, that really, in my examples here, all the ones... Um, All the ones that have basically m going getting bigger are above, and all the ones having m getting smaller are below. Okay. So I've got all of those above, and we've got all of these below. Now, do you, can you guys classify the top ones and the bottom ones? Do you have some sort of way or sort of thing to de describe the top three and some way or thing to describe the bottom three? Uh, So I don't know if we're particularly technical with it. I mean, we will get there, but is there some sort of, you know, so the top three, all of them have the gradient increasing as you go from left to right. And the bottom three all have the gradient decreasing as you go from left to right. So what's, 
what sort of thing can you tell me about the curve if the gradient is increasing as you go from left to right? Any ideas, um, Janelle, Paris, Tiffany? What would the curve look like as, you know, if, if the gradient is increasing? So if we are drawing a curve, Now it doesn't really matter what we're drawing, but let's just hypothetically draw something. Now we, is this gradient positive or negative? Negative. negative. Right. And if we want it, if we want the gradient to get bigger in terms of like a number, then it will have to, it will give you more or less negative. If we want the gradient to increase, then it will have to be more or less negative. Less. Right, so it's gonna get more shallow, right? And then it's got to get more shallow. And, you know, let's say it, you know, there's no limit, it keeps getting bigger. So at some point it's got to go positive, right? If we keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger. And we force it to go bigger. So at some point it's gonna go through zero and there's gonna go positive, right? And more and more positive, right? So there will always be this kind of sort of shape to it, right? Now, of course, it might not have to be go bigger than zero. So, you know, it could still increase. And so we could have the situation I had earlier. You could have be very negative and then get more positive and then get more positive and then get more positive and then get more positive, but never, and it could always slowly get more positive, but it might not ever be it might not ever hit zero, right? So can you see that no matter what, and, and that it's always going to have this sort of idea. And if I start at zero or something like it, it's just going to give me this sort of thing. So I'm going to get this sort of shape here. Do you guys know how you might describe all of these, all three on the board right now? Even if you use non-technical words, is there any way you would describe it using like non-technically? Which way are they curving? Curve up? Yeah. So they're curving, call it curving up because the gradient is increasing, right? So as the gradient is increasing, that you always get this sort of curve up kind of idea. And so these are all curving up. Now, if you're looking at your parabola, that would be your sort of your, what you might've called your smiley face or whatever. And the opposite is your, you know, frowny face or sad face, right? And these are curving down. Does that make sense? So not technically these are curving up. And these are curving down. Now, do you guys ever learn the word to kind of describe curve up or curve down with your parabolas? If A is positive, then it's a smiley face, which means it's something up. Concave. Okay. Yeah. So these are concave up. And these are concave down. That's the sort of technical word to use. But the idea is just whether it's curving up or curving down. And the curve is a result of your gradient changing. Because think about this. What if your gradient doesn't change? It will just be a line. Right, you'll get a line. It does a line curve. No. No. So that's why the second derivative represents the rate of change of the first derivative 
which is the rate of change of the gradient. So what that means is that this represents concavity, or if you like, you know, how much curve there is, how much and which direction and which direction the function curves, if you like. So technically it's called concavity, but you can think of it as how much and in which way, up or down, the function curves. Got that? Yep. Good. Okay, so let's run through a little bit more theory. And we'll focus back on the first derivative. So remember, you've got your function, which is fx. And then you take the derivative, gives f dash x, which represents the gradient of the tangent. And we'll just focus on this part for the moment. So you've got your function. When you derive it, and you'll get your f dash x. All right. Now, we already said this represents the gradient of the tangent to the curve. Now, I want you to think of a few particular cases. Specifically, I want you to think what could we determine if the first derivative is positive, what does that mean? If the first derivative is negative, what does that mean? And the first derivative is equal to zero, what does that mean? So think about it. The first derivative represents the gradient of the tangent to the curve. Now, if we say the first derivative is positive, what does that mean? So at a particular point, the first root is positive. What would that represent? Gradient is positive? It does. And so let's just draw out some root curve. Um, I'll keep it easy for the moment. So for example, is the gradient positive for this curve? Yes. Yeah, it is, right? The gradient is indeed positive for this curve. Now, is it positive for every value on this curve I've drawn? Yes. Yeah, so this is a curve where the first root will always be positive. Now, obviously, that's not true for all curves. And some curves will have positive and negative ones, but let's keep it simple for the moment. For this one, the first derivative is always, a, is, it's always positive. Now, if the gradient is positive, which is true graphically, what does that mean about the function? So the gradient is positive, that's correct. But what does that mean about the function? The function is also positive. You wouldn't know it's positive. For example, it's negative here. So we don't know if the first root is positive, we don't know the function is positive because right now the you know this part's negative. It could be, it might not be, right? I could have, you know, this, in which case it is positive, but I don't know that, right? So, look at the values of the function as I go to the right. What's happening to the values? Increase. Right. So this is what we call an increasing function. Have you guys heard of that term before? No. Okay, well, 
Now you do. This is something you need to remember. So, this is what's called an increasing function. Increasing function simply means that the gradient is positive at that point. Now, if it's strictly increasing, then it, we tell you that it's increasing for all values of x. So in this particular example, in this example, fx is increasing for all values of x. But it doesn't have to be. So for example, let's take something trustworthy like your you know, parabola. So something about your parabola, is the gradient of the parabola y equals x squared always positive? No. You can see quite clearly that it's not, right? It's negative here and it's positive there. So something like y equals x squared, we would say, is increasing for x is greater than zero. And that's just what increasing means. Increasing just means the first derivative is positive. Does that make sense? Yes. So as far as our definitions go, gradient is positive, correct, but that means increasing function. Now, remember, we're not saying it's necessarily, no, we're not saying that function is increasing for all values of x. It might be, it might not be, but the, if a first derivative is positive at one point, then we would say the function is increasing at that point. Probably better to say function is increasing. If we say increasing function, normally we mean that the function is increasing at all, all values of x. For f dash x being negative, that means the gradient is negative. And that means the function is decreasing at that point. Now, what does it mean if f dash x equal to zero? It's a straight line. All lines are straight. True. It's a horizontal line. Right. Your gradient is horizontal. Now this will probably give you a new term that you probably haven't heard of in this context before. So the moment you've got a horizontal gradient, that means fx, the function, is not increasing or decreasing at that point because you know it's not positive, it's not negative. And we give this new term, the function is stationary with an a at that point. In other words, you have what's called a stationary point. Okay, so tell me when you guys are done with this um, with this slide, and we'll move on to the next slide shortly. I'm I'm done with it. All right, Paris. One sec. Yep, yeah, no problem. While we're there, Tiffany, are you back? Okay, not sure what's happening with Tiffany. Yeah, I'm done. All right, good. All right, so reiterating, and this is important, you do need to know these sort of definitions. So that means then, algebraically, if you have f dash x being positive, that means increasing. And this goes both ways. If you're asked in a question to find when the function is increasing, that means you find the first derivative being positive because that's exactly what it means. If you have f dash x being negative, well, that means decreasing. But if you are asked to find when something is decreasing, that also means first derivative is negative. 
if you are asked to find you know a stationary point that means equal to zero by definition that means it's stationary and if it's stationary it must mean the first degree is zero make sense yes yeah. right so let's just you know no no intercepts we don't care about the intercepts let's just you know label some random points Um, I will build in another one actually. Oops. Hmm. All right, never mind. All right, let's start at A. Paris is this increasing, decreasing, what's happening? Increasing. Right. Because if you think about the gradient, you may or may not have to draw it in. Um, it's up to you. But if you want to draw in the tangent, that would therefore be sloping upward. And indeed, this would therefore be increasing. Correct. All right. B, Janelle? A stationary point. Correct. C, Paris? Mm, decreasing. Good. All right. D? Stationary? Good. Yep. It's e? Increasing. Correct. F? Stationary. Good. G? Decreasing. H? Stationary. I? Increasing. J? Increasing. Um, K. Stationary. L. Uh, decreasing. Inc well, think about it. If you're drawing the tangent, is it sloping up or down? Sloping up, increasing. Right. So these are all increasing, 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 increasing. And all your decreasing ones are here. And all your stationary ones are here. Does it all make sense? Yes. So hopefully that all, I mean, you don't have to draw it out, but if you did, it would look something along these lines. All right. Now, while I'm doing that, to, um, you know, I now want you to examine in particular the stationary points. Do all the stationary points look the same or can you classify them in some way? Do you notice different types of stationary points? So for example, let's examine B, this point. What might you call that point? The top, the peak. Along those lines, but you normally don't call it that, right? But you're on the right track. So it is a, it is the sort of highest it can go. Turning point? Oh, it, is, it is a turning point. Let's stick with turning point for the moment. So it is a turning point. What about D? Is D a turning point? Yes. Is F a turning point? Yeah. Is H a turning point? Yeah. Are all stationary points turning points? Uh, no. So what is not a turning point, but is a stationary point? The S, the K? Yeah. So K is an example of where it's not a turning point. So a stationary point, for example, it could be a turning point, And that's something that, you know, you will kind of come across. And, but it might not be. Now, do you guys know what we call a point like this, like, like K? 
You might not. I just want to see if you guys know. Not okay. sure. Then it's a fairly special point. It might not mean too much to you right now. It will as time goes on. But right now, just learn it might be what's called a horizontal point of inflection. Okay. So it could be a horizontal point of inflection. As we, you know, next week we might talk about what points of inflections are. Horizontal point of inflection is a particular type of point of inflection, and it will look something like this. It's like your X cube thing, all right? Or it could be a turning point. You know, a turning point has two types, yeah? You've got things like B and F, which are as high as you can go, and you've got things like D and H, which are as low as you can go. Any ideas on what we call them? They both start with M as a hint. Maximum and minimum. Correct. So, you guys happy with that? Yes. All right. So therefore, what we're basically saying is, for curve sketching purposes, and because we have thought about what the derivative means, if f dash x equals zero, you have a stationary point. And if you want a stationary point, first derivative must equal zero, by definition. All right, well, that's true, but your stationary points have three situations. It could be the maximum, which would look something along the lines of this. It could be a minimum, which would look something along the lines of this, or you could have what's called a horizontal point of inflection. which will look along the lines of something like this. Now, your problem is, just because you know you've got a stationary point, doesn't mean you know what type of stationary point you've got. You see what I mean? You've worked out that you've got a stationary point, but, you know, well, there's still so many things it could be, you don't exactly know what you have. So how are we gonna work out what we have? Well, we need to figure out if we have a maximum, a minimum, or a horizontal point of inflection. Now, since they're all stationary points, this first derivative must be zero in all cases. Okay. Because after all, they're all stationary points. That really doesn't help us figure out what it is. Okay. And well, it shouldn't. However, we need to differentiate between them. Now there are two ways to do this, all right? And well, one way to think about it is basically, we could trick it, figure out using the first derivative, if it's a maximum or a minimum, by what's called the table of values. So let's consider method one. So we are differentiating, or you know, telling the difference between a maximum, a minimum, and a horizontal point of inflection. So remember, if you have a maximum, it looks like this. If you have a minimum, it looks like this. And if you have a horizontal point of inflection, it will either look like this or like this. You have your two options. But it will look something along those lines. All right, now, the first degree represents what? Rate of change. Yes, it does. It represents the rate of change. What does it um, represent graphically? The gradient. Correct. So we know at that point, the gradient is zero, right? That's the whole point. But what about the gradient before that point, to the left? Hmm. 
What about to the left? Still a gradient. Yeah, it's still a gradient, but is the gradient, what can you tell us about the gradient on the left-hand side of the maximum? It's positive. It's got to be positive. It's got to be increasing. Right? You can't really draw a maximum where it's decreasing to a maximum, right? This, it, 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 can't, it doesn't work. How, how do you, can you draw a decreasing to a max? Is that possible? No. Not really, right? You just can't, you just can't do it. And once you hit the max, what about to the right-hand side? Negative. Mm -hmm. it's be negative. So one way to tell whether it's a maximum or a minimum or a positive point of inflection is, well, if it's a maximum, then at some value A, let's call this A, and above A and below A, then the first derivative must be positive, zero, negative. This would indicate a maximum. Does that make sense? Yes. And similarly, for minimum, you're going to get negative, zero, positive. So equivalently, you'll, get, you'll need to work out the gradient for you know, less than, at, and above. And in this case, you'll get negative, zero, positive. Now, for a horizontal point of inflection, so this will signify a minimum. Unless you know what type you have, you're just going to need to, the point is, it doesn't change. You can see it's either positive, zero, positive, or negative, zero, negative. In other words, if you have f dash x either being positive, zero, positive, or negative, zero, negative, then it's a horizontal point of inflection. Does that make sense? Yep. Good. Now, that is not the only way to do it, but it is one possible way we could do it. So for example, let's say, um, All right, so let's say that I wanted to work out for example, y equals 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 36x plus 15. Now it's a cubic. You might not know how to do that. But let's just try and work out any key points we've got. So firstly, let's find the derivative. So if we find the derivative, I think you guys won't have too much trouble to find 6x squared plus 6x minus 36. Now that's the derivative, which remember represents the gradient. Now, because we don't really know what this looks like, it might be helpful for us to find the stationary points. So let's find the stationary points. So in other words, you'll let y dash equal to zero, which means we'll solve for 6x squared plus 6x minus 36 equal to zero. Now, if we're trying to solve for this equal to zero, what's the first thing we might do to make it easier? Factorize. We could just divide by six, but yeah, essentially, 
So you've got x squared plus x minus 6 equals 0, which would make it easier to factorize. I'm not sure if you meant divide by 6 when you said factorize, or just factorize directly, but you could factor out a 6, but you could just get rid of it as well, since it's equal to 0 on the other side. Um, and this is factorizable. Can you see the factors? Two and three. So it's going to be x plus three and x minus two. And in other words, you'll get x equals minus three or x equals two, right? So think about what we've done here. We've taken a function. We've derived it. We've let that derivative equal to zero, which means we are solving for when the derivative, which is the gradient, is zero. So we're solving for when the gradient is horizontal, which means we're solving for the stationary points. In other words, at this point, we know that x equals two and x equals negative three are stationary points. In other words, y has a stationary point at x equals 2 and x equals negative 3. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, I don't know yet, and assuming I don't do any thinking yet, I don't know if these are positive, like if they're, you know, maximum or minimum or anything. I mean, if you think about it, you'll know, but, but you know, and we probably should think about it. But um, look, here's the thing. Just, just think about it sort of common sense, right? What type of curve is this? Cubic. It's a cubic. Now, is the cubic positive or negative? Positive. Right. So it means it's going to look something like this, right? Just roughly, very roughly. Yeah. Right? You know, because it's, it's either that or this, and this is the negative and this is the positive one, right? Mm. So I'm not kind of doing anything really properly anything or anything, but you understand that your cubic will look something like this, very roughly. Do you expect any stationary points? Yes. yes. Right, you expect one here and one here, right? Yeah. Now, the one on the right, the stationary point on the right, does it, is it a minimum or a maximum? Minimum. And the one on the left? Maximum. Right. But now think about it. Can you possibly draw a cubic? Remember, it's a cubic. That's positive, so it goes up and down here, where this is not a maximum on the left and it's not a minimum on the right. Could you possibly reverse it? Is it possible to kind of have a maximum and then a minimum? Could you somehow have a maximum and then a minimum? And it being a cubic? Yeah. Oh, no. Not really, right? I mean, it's, it's got to be more than a cubic then. So we kind of already know, really. I mean, obviously, we haven't proven it. But we know the one on the right, which is x equals 2, is a minimum. And the one on x equals minus 3 is a maximum. We already know that, just if we thought about it. And I encourage you to think about it. That's why I'm you know, showing you how we would think about it even before we do it. But obviously, we would actually have to show it in an exam. Like you can't just you know, do that. But this kind of tells us that this is the minimum and this is the maximum. Now, if this is a point, we want to find the actual point. So your next step is to actually find the point. So if you like to be, you know, we need to find the y coordinates. We actually haven't found them yet. So at x equals 2, y equals, sub it in, we're going to get 115, apparently. No, that's because I subbed in the wrong, I, I put a plus. Yeah, negative 29 sounds more correct. And we're going to sub in x equals negative 3.
And the answer is six. Now, again, does this time with what we said, does this look like this is a minimum and this is a maximum? Considering where they are? Yeah. Yeah, it does. So everything's making sense so far. But of course, we haven't technically shown it mathematically. So let's show it mathematically. So the next thing is show if it's a max or a mean or a horizontal point of inflection. So what I'll do is I'll do it for x equals two. You can do it for the x equals minus three, but basically we're going to sub in x equals two and let's say 2.1 and 1.9 into f dash x, this thing up here. Now, if I sub in two, I'll clearly get zero. Now, if I do six times 1.9 all squared, plus six times 1.9, minus 36, I'm going to get negative 2.94. Now, the number's not important. What's important is that it's negative. If I sub in 2.1, I'm going to get 3.06. And again, what's important is not the number, it's the fact it's positive. So that means I'm going to get negative, zero positive, which represents that it's going to look like this, like this, like this, which then confirms it's a minimum. Does that tie with our common sense conclusion here? Yes. It does. And of course, if you sub it in with negative three, you should find it's a maximum. So what that then means at this point in time, that we already know where the minimum maximum values are. So in other words, we know we've got two negative 29, and I'll do it here, I'll do it over here, just so you can have everything on the same sort of page. So that means we might not know what the x intercepts are, but we do know at this point that we've got a cubic and it's going to look something along the lines of this. We don't know what the x intercepts are, but we do know that this will be 2, negative 29. We do know that will be 15. We do know that will be negative 3 and 6. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So what I want you to do is I want you to replicate those steps on your own um, for a new question that I'll write up on the board. I'll go back to the earlier slide um, just so you can kind of follow the steps through. But can you guys try it with y equals x alpha three? Plus four x squared plus four x as well as y equals, you know, um, 16. Oh, that one might be a bit hard. How about, you know, x plus 2, x minus 3 all squared. All right, give it a go with those two. Yes, so what we want to do is find the stationary points. That means, that means we firstly take your first derivative which will be 3x squared plus 8x plus 4. And you want to solve for that equal to 0. So you'll try and factorize it. And if you want to get 4, um, 2 and 2 seems to work. That leaves you with x equals negative 2 over 3, or x equals negative 2. Now that you've got both of your x coordinates, you'll need to find your corresponding y coordinates. So just sub that into your calculator. And that will be 16. And if you do negative two thirds, ooh, I subbed in the wrong thing. 
All right. Looks like I'll need to redo that part. So negative eight plus four times four minus eight should have been zero. And if you put in negative two thirds, you'll get negative 32 over 27. Now, if we then check against, if we use the table of values method, you want to go to the right, so that's negative 1.9. You want to go to the left, so that's negative 2.1. Subbed in through the first derivative, which is over here. So I've got three. Let's put in negative 1.9, all squared, plus eight, negative 1.9, plus four, we'll get negative 0 0.37. We'll get zero here. We'll put in 2.1 here, negative. and we'll get 0 0.43. So that's positive, zero negative, which tells us that this is a maximum. And remember, we don't need um, that to tell us it's a maximum. We'll think why in a moment, but let's just quickly do this one. So we've got negative two thirds. To the right, let's just pick a number like negative 0 0.5, and to the left, let's pick a number like negative 0 0.7. We know that's zero. Let's put in 0 0.7. That is negative. 0 0.13. Importantly, it's negative. If you put in negative 0.5, you'll get 0 0.75. Importantly, that's positive. So that's negative 0 positive, which tells us it's a minimum. Now, that means we do know our points and we know that we've got a maximum at negative two zero and a minimum at negative two thirds, negative 32 over 27. And if you just compare these numbers, that kind of makes sense. That's above that. But just remember, we don't really need it either, right? You've got this, which is very basically, it's a cubic. So it's got to look something like this very roughly. And we know that this is going to be your negative two thirds because it's to the right. And this is your negative two, which is on the left. So we know that this is our minimum and we know this is our maximum. And that ties in with what we've done here. And also your y equals x cubed plus four x squared plus four. If we ignore the calculus, you can factor out the x. So really, you already know how to draw this. It's a cubic that passes at zero and bounces back at negative two. So even without the calculus, we already know that the graph looks like this. And since the graph looks like this, we do expect a maximum at negative two zero, and that's exactly what we got one at negative two, zero. All we've done with the calculus really is work out that this point is negative two thirds and negative 32 over 27. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, of course, you, don't, you didn't have to do it this way. I'm just showing you how you could be flexible and do it other way. Um, but if, of course, if you start with the calculus, you've got the same result, right? You've got a maximum here and a minimum here, and it looks exactly like that. So I'll do the next question that we had on the board. Just, we'll do it the opposite way. I'll do it the common sense way, then I'll do it the calculus, and I'll give you your homework. So the question was, y equals x plus two, x minus three all squared. Now, this is therefore a cubic. 
x plus 2. That means x equals negative 2. And this is x equals 3. The double root. Which therefore means that your graph is going to look like it's a positive cubic. So it's going to be up here, down here. Bounce back at 3. Cross at negative 2. So it's going to look something like this. Approximately. Now we don't really know if the maximum is going to be to the right or left of the positive um, of the y-axis. We don't really know that for sure. We could guess, but it would kind of be a little bit of a guess. Um, probably it would be to the right, but it's it would really be a guess. Um, yeah, it, it probably would be. Well, the inflection point will be. Anyway, don't worry about it. We'll just work it out. So if you were to work this out, then you would derive it. You can either expand this or you would derive it using the product rule. Let's use the product rule to give you some practice. Derive the first one, which is one, times the second one unchanged, plus derive the second one, which is two x minus three times one, times the first one unchanged. You can factor out the x minus three, leaving you with x minus three plus two times x plus two. That means you've got x equals negative three or x equals negative one third, which means it's on the left, which is good. We've drawn it in the right sort of spot. You can sub in to find y. Well, y for that one is zero. And y for that one will be Five hundred over twenty-seven, and so really, we've worked out that it's three zero and negative one third, and five hundred over twenty-seven. Now, of course, we really should be proving it to maximum. I'll leave it for you to prove as an exercise, but negative one third is negative zero point three three. So. To the right, you might have negative 0 0.3. To the left, you might have negative 0 0.4. That is zero. You really should find, if you sub it in the numbers, that that one is positive. Oops. Um, that one is negative, and that one is positive. And for three, if you pick 2.9 and 3.1, you should be getting a negative zero positive situation. Did you guys do that um, when you had the time to do that during class? Is, you know, does that match what we got? Yes. yes. Good. All right. So that's what we will um, we'll be moving on to the second derivative next week. But just remember, first derivative represents the gradient or more specifically the gradient of the tangent. If it's positive, it's increasing. If it's negative, it's decreasing, which means it's sloping down. If it's equal to zero, you've got your stationary points, of which there are three types. Maximum, minimum being two types, which are both turning points. And the third type being a horizontal point of inflection. How do you tell? We've only covered one way at the moment. That way is to sub it into the first derivative around that point, sometimes called the table of values. And that will help you by working out which way it's sloping, whether it's you know maximum, minimum, or horizontal point of inflection. So, your homework is to look at the chapter. Um, chapter 16. So last time you did chapter 16a, so this time do chapter 16 b and c. And Tiffany, um, I'm not sure if you're caught up yet, but if you haven't introduced chapter 16a from last week as well. Uh, since I missed um, basically the whole class, you, you are going to email us as always, right? Yep, yeah, sure.
Although, um, Janelle, I don't have your email address. So I understand Paris forwarded to you, but um, I don't I actually have your email address. put it in the chat. Oh, you did? All right, great. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right, see you guys. See you.